Hello, I'm Giovanni Pegida, and this is the FYI on Youth Ministry, a podcast from the Fuller Youth Institute. This season, we are focusing on talking about race with teenagers and each other. In today's episode, we're talking about curriculum. In this conversation, we dive into how to choose inclusive curriculum and how to adapt curriculum for our students' context. But first, let's hear what young people said about this topic. Even though schools do try their best to reach out to the kids, um, it, it all really depends on who you're trying to reach out to. And oftentimes I feel you start to be left out because then there's this certain demographic that they focus on only and then everybody else is excluded. And that that doesn't seem to be intentional, but that's just the way that it is. Okay, so what's one thing about the way that you have been taught in youth group that would make you feel included or represented or belonging uh belonging to me it means to yeah be uh be comfortable in a place with uh that's with other people yeah i think belonging like in general it's pretty it's pretty conditional unless you share like a bond like a closer bond with those people i've had somebody they were um biracial different mix than me but they were saying how like it's It's a struggle because they don't feel like they can identify with one group fully. They kind of have two parts of themselves. Hey, this is Rolson Hernandez. I'm project assistant and podcast co-producer of the FYI on Youth Ministry. And this is Giovanni Panginda, a project coordinator and co-host of the FYI on Youth Ministry. So today... We're going to talk about how we can evaluate um, if curriculum is inclusive and relevant to our students and and how we can make curriculum more racially and ethically inclusive for our students as well. Great. And we're very excited to have Oshita Moore as our guest today. Oshita is a pastor, a podcaster, speaker, the author of Dear White Peacemakers and Shalom Sisters. And Oshita is also a wife and mother of teens. She's also co-founder of Made for Pax, which is an organization that inspires and equips the next generation through content created by people of color. So Oshita, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for being with us today. Um, in the spirit of contemplation, <laughs> how about we start <laughs> with this question, okay? So as you work for Shalom and racial justice, what is one of the most life-giving spiritual practices that you've incorporated into your life? Um, I really love breath prayers. Um, and so during the pandemic or at the beginning, at the beginning of lockdown, um, I was just so full of anxiety over just how all the things, how our life was shifting and changing. Um, you know, I'd known about breath prayers. I, you know, done a couple of them, you know, but I never really like integrated them into my spiritual formation. So I posted to social the that same night after I finished teaching that class, um, hey, Nick, tomorrow I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and do a little reading and create a breath prayer based on that reading. If anybody wants to watch on live, I'll do that. The way I describe a breath prayer is I craft a name for God and that's meaningful for me and then a request for the moment. And so like looking at scripture, pulling a name for God, breathing that in, allowing myself to contemplate on that and then breathing out a request, just allowing that to set my intention for my day. Um, it was just a beautiful thing for me to begin my day, but then go back to throughout my day. And I, as somebody who has asthma, it feels really profound to use my breath. But also, like I joked, the world was shut down with the respiratory virus. And so what better way to be subversive than use our breath to connect to God? So breath prayers are definitely one of my favorite contemplative practices. I love breath prayers. Well, um, you know, today we are focusing on the tools that we use to teach our students. So, you know, this may be curriculum or other resources that provide content and guidance for us as we as we teach. And um, we've mentioned before that this generation, Gen, Gen Z, 
is the most diverse generation in U.S. history, okay? So it's important for us to be aware of that and to know what that means for our students. O- Oshida, as, as someone who lives in multiple uh, racial spaces, can you share um, any examples or experiences that uh, illustrate why racially inclusive curriculum or content is especially important for our young people? I mean, from my own experience as a young person, um, and I was in a church with a lot of amazing mentors, but it was mostly white community. Um, or, and the church that I attended was mostly white, I think like 80% white. But the, my mentors were these people who loved me and loved Jesus, but there was a great disconnect between my lived experience and the questions that were budding in me around how my faith and my experience as a person of color in mostly white spaces integrated. I used to remember saying things a lot like, I don't feel like I fit in or, um, I don't know that I belong. And they would always offer me such great counsel from scripture because they were thinking I was just a really insecure or shy kid. And really at the core, I was wrestling with racial identity and I didn't know how to communicate that to those white leaders. So I don't ever like to, I don't, when I look back, I don't want to blame them that they didn't meet me in that space. I just don't think that they had the language or the awareness. And so I think like when it comes to just even thinking about curriculum, you have to, as the leader, be the one that cultivates that awareness in you. So are you reading? Are you paying attention to racial dynamics? Are you having those conversations with your peers so that you've worked through your discomfort and you've allowed the spirit to um, be a part of those conversations in meaningful ways for you so that then you can turn around and see that for your students. Because I think that first touch point of that relational, they see me within my racial context, within my social location is super important. Um, and so that that's kind of just my the first thing that I think of when I when I'm even thinking about curriculum. And then like the practical piece of it is like, well, who are the teachers? What's the music they're referencing? What are the, what are the stories and history that they're referencing? Or just the, like, like just sit with it. And, um, you know, one thing that I'm always mindful of is, um, you know, the white black binary that, that we often tend to think of when we think about race or diversity. So I'm always like looking for pe- for cu- curriculum or looking for teachers of d- like different races and different cultural identities and different social locations. Um, and so, yeah, like when I'm choosing a curriculum or when I'm even choosing like if, where I'm taking the youth for a summer, you know, go to camp, who's the speaker that week? And what experience does that speaker have um, in a racially inclusive, you know, co- diverse community? Um, So from your experience, um, what can white leaders do to evaluate how racially inclusive a curriculum is or to make it more so? So I think the first thing is, um, like, are you already doing the work? Um, So, yeah, because you have to know, um, you have to know these, these concepts, you have to understand this language. For white leaders, that can be really overwhelming when you hear the phrase do the work because it's like, well, what work and how much work and the work feels overwhelming and it feels super helpless. Like I'm just me, this one leader in this one group church with like 50 youth, what? Um, When you do the work, there's an intentionality that has to happen that's not just head knowledge. I I talk about this idea of becoming an anti-racist peacemaker where you we do the work in a holistic way we learn with our head but we also we engage with the work with our heart and that looks like being in therapy that looks like having your a pastor or 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 a leader of color that is willing to walk alongside you as you're learning and able to process ideas with you having a spiritual director um just being able to sit as a white person who is experiencing a kind of trauma when they're doing this work. It is an upheaval of a lot of the ideas that they just took for granted or just or have believed for so long. And so to do this work, knowing how this work makes you feel and actually having that support system around you gives you an imagination for how your students might feel 
and what kind of support system they need around them. Because really like working with young people, especially Gen Z, it's breaking through that exterior of, uh, you know, that skepticism and that, and that desire, that, that nervousness around being vulnerable, it's breaking through that with authenticity and building trust. And we can only do that if, you know, we show that we have some interest in like where they're coming from and what they're experiencing. And I think the last thing is, is I, you, you're going to bump up against, you know, pushback. You're going to, you know, you're going to be in process with this work. So having a community around you, that's like, this is good. This is a good curriculum we've chosen. This is a good direction we're taking our organization. We're taking our ministry. Um, you are the right person to do this kind of supporting you and cheering you on is really, really important too, because you can get really overwhelmed and then just be like, well, you know, we tried that, you know, diverse, racially inclusive thing. We tried that in our org and it just, you know, it didn't work. So let's just go back to what we used to do or, or what we're comfortable with. Yeah. So one of the things that's also important to keep in mind is that we are all learning. We were even people of color are still learning and we're all in this process together. Um, so on the other hand, um, what encouragement or tips would you give leaders of color who are choosing or adapting curriculum? Um, and so one of the things that I am looking at as a person of color is how do I connect something that I'm seeing in the curriculum with something that is culturally relevant um, to me? Um, so for instance, maybe I'm looking at a song, looking at, you know, a piece of curriculum and they bring up a song about, um, you know, peace and peacemaking. Um, maybe they're bringing up a song, you know, something about like baptism. So like a song about baptism or a song about, you know, the waters of baptism. Well, as an African-American, I immediately think, oh, there is a song called Wade in the Water. So what I can do is I can sub out that song for that culturally relevant piece of art so that in there, they're similar in their meaning. They're similar in the you know in the language they they teach the same thing but it's just swapping out a majority culture piece of art or a majority culture idea or theologian or, or for a person of color that's where being a leader of color part of my work is learning learning as much as i can learning from different leaders of color reading as many theologians as i can or surveying the content and making it relevant to my students um you know another thing that i would i would ask is i i would i don't want to carry the responsibility and the weight of like doing shifting all the curriculum around myself so i i have other leaders of color who I can say like, hey, can you look at this with me? I'll look at something you're working on. Like building that relationship, carrying that load because being leaders of color um, can get really exhausting and to and feel overwhelming and feel really lonely. And so just building that community and those spaces where I can process those things are really important to me. Thank you so much. I've been holding all my uh, amens because... <laughs> Because that's the kind of church yeah. I grew up on. It's like, amen, <laughs> amen. <laughs> yeah, growing up, I didn't have a youth pastor. I kind of became the de facto leader <laughs> of my own youth group. And like, I had to be the one to like look through curriculum and just kind of being confused and like, oh, like we don't have this kind of song. And, you know, what what kind of song can I switch this with? And um, so like everything that you said brought back memories of my first couple years of, of youth ministry. <laughs> yeah. And I think I would add to that, like I, we can look outside of what we are usually um, used to seeing as curriculum and bring so much more with, um, with the many things that we encounter, not just in literature or um, inside of the church, but also like in culture. Um, another thing that I've done is like, I've talked about television shows, you know, I, we talk about like, what, how's grace, how is compassion shown in this episode or like in this show? There's also like so many more things that we can do um, if we just think a little bit outside the box sometimes. When uh, Taylor Swift's album came out, um, for example, uh, there was this one song, um, Bad Blood, right? And this theme about revenge and, you know, anger. And so um, 
you know so we talked about that like does god have like bad blood like in in that sense that like in the old, old testament we hear of of god being you know a, a quote unquote jealous god right when it comes to the idols and so we we had a fun talking about that we talked about movies too like the themes of movies um and um what does that relate to how does that relate to um you know god in the bible and um, I love talking about this with Rosalind as well, just because I, I, I think Rosalind and I both believe, like, you know, if God, again, is the author of truth, then, you know, all truth will lead ultimately to God. And um, a lot of my students, and I, I'm pretty sure a lot of Gen Z, they are searching for truth. And, um, you know, uh, we just got to help uh, contextualize it. So I, I want to talk a little bit more about um, yeah your your curriculum. So you you are a spiritual director and a co-founder of Made for Pax, where you know Christians of color create slow, beautiful, Jesus-centered content for the discipleship of the next generation. And can, can you tell us uh, like about the inten- intentionality behind the slow pace and the diversity of the content creators? Like like how is how is the content created? and intended to be used in that way um, that's beneficial as we teach the Gen Z? Um, I will say I'm in, I'm finishing up my spiritual direction. So this is my internship year. So I'm PAX a spiritual director, but like, I'm, I'm not let loose on the world yet to be everybody's director just for PAX. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that uh, we at PAX noticed Um, is that this world and the pace that we all have just grown accustomed to is very is very fast it's very results driven Um, it's very you know it focuses on status Um, it's very dehumanizing you know it goes to that like human human doing not human being Um, and so PAX means peace and so we really look at the Hebraic concept of Shalom. And in my book, and the way that, you know, Pax talks about it, we think of Shalom as God's dream for the world as it should be. Um, Everything made whole, justice, nothing broken, flourishing. Um, And it's just really difficult to flourish in a space and in a frame of mind that asks you to overextend yourself and asks you to um, just re- reject or ignore your deepest need as a human being. So what do you need to feel fully human? Well, what do we need? We all need space to slow down. We all need opportunities to take deep breaths. Um, we all need um, quiet, you know, I can't, I can tell you like the funny thing about like how, you know, we can't, we can't do anything without our phones. Like we, we can't even like go to the bathroom without our phones. Like if we're standing in line and we don't have our phone or like, you know, we go to a wedding and they're like, put your phone away. And you're like, but this is your special day. And I need to let everybody know that I was here for your special day. Like we are so, we cannot separate ourselves. Go ahead. <laughs> if, there, if there's no photo, it didn't happen. Right? Exactly, right? <laughs> um, and so part of the slow um, intention behind PAX was, is us creating content to k- take that deep breath and to just imagine what life would be like or how their life could feel if they listen to a meditation that I lead that invites them to sit in silence. That slowness is is such an important resistance to the ways that the, the communities of color have been dehumanized. So many communities of color have been used as commodities in order to like produce more um, or have been marginalized to the point that all the, that poverty, you know, they struggle so much, we struggle so much with poverty. And so we can't imagine rest because we have to, we have to take two, three jobs, you know? Um, and so I think that, for communities of color, creating content for people of color is really resisting the white supremacy that prevents people of color from feeling f- fully human because, you know, because of the way that communities and people of color have been dehumanized and commodified, like I said. And so, you know, we talk a lot about at PAX, you know, rest. And I think too, for Gen Z, for, you know, young people, the things that are going on in their life, uh, the things that they're passionate about, justice, beauty, um, 
not being able to connect that to God is is a lack of discipleship of slow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the human being aspect rather than the human doing, because, um, at, you know, at times we might want to teach our students like about a story or a concept and we might forget to help um, them embody or integrate what we have learned. So um, so first, can you can you uh, describe what it means to embody or to integrate um, what we've learned and and. Can you share, you know, a couple of, of more spiritual practices that we could use to integrate into our teaching um, when curriculum doesn't provide that? Yeah, I love to teach Juliana Noor, which is body prayer, which uh, are four postures that we do with our body. Um, and it's um, await, allow, accept and attend. And people can go look look this up. But Juliana Noor, which is body prayer. Um, I love to teach that when I'm teaching prayer. Um, so whenever whenever I'm feeling disconnected from God in my prayer life, just doing those motions and 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 creating just a one word a one sentence prayer. So God, I'm awaiting your closeness. I'm allowing myself to be aware that you see me and that you love me. Um, I accept my limitations and that I'm like struggling with anxiety right now, but I'm attending to my soul by entering into this prayer like I just did that on the fly but like having those motions and those words somehow makes prayer not this thing where I sit alone and I'm just like ruminating on all the stuff or that I'm like filling my journal and just like ranting to God but like it's actually in my body um just the idea of like getting up and moving your body and talking about a, a you know, your spirituality allows you, allows you to process it in a different way. It allows you to create some sort of muscle memory. Just having that, those memories is something that this Holy Spirit can come back and say, you know, when we, when we were like struggling, do you remember that? And I think too, you know, one of my favorite things to do when I think about embodying my spirituality is um, doing my very best to do things that like that are joyful or that feel good in our body. So like eating together, like creating a meal together and then eating that together, like that is a really beautiful way of embodying your your spiritual formation. And then of course, going back to breath prayers. Yeah. I love that. I'm taking notes because I, I, I do I do a kind of prayer. I call it the wellness prayer, which is like a, a prayer that deals with the different healths uh, that we have. So like mental health, social health, um, physical health, spiritual health um, and so forth. And um, my I, I didn't think my kids would love it, but and they love it like they they, they just embrace the silence and um just being able to slow down and i you know one one time i actually, I actually took it away you know because i i didn't think they enjoyed it right because i i was like like oh surely they don't like like doing this is like 20 minutes of silence like they can't do this right and then um i had them fill out like a like a review of like, you know, what what did you like about our youth group these past couple, you know, months and what did, didn't you like? And almost all of them said, what happened to this prayer? Oh my <laughs> Bring gosh. It back. I, you'll have to send me that prayer. I love so, that so much. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing I just thought of while you were saying that is my husband and I visited a church and they did this thing called Milestones. And you would, um, if something cool happened in your life, and it's kind of like prayers and praise of the people, but so you would grab a stone and then come to the front of the church and you would tell the congregation like what happened and then you would drop the stone into this vase. And then everybody in the church said, milestones! So you would hear like everybody like celebrating with you. I mean, that's an embodied practice, you know? Yeah, wow, okay. Yeah, I think... Um young people really do like silence and like being introspective more than other generations have and so like i'm also an enneagram five so i live in introspection naturally <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um another one that i really like is um like this really contemplative way of entering into the biblical narrative so we um 
we did this with my young adults and um, I can't remember who it was exactly, but it was one of the women in Jesus um, genealogy. And we, and we read the story through one of the books that we were reading and then we read it from the Bible. And I just said like, go into the story and talk to the characters that are in this story. Um, that's one of the ways to like get their imagination to also live into the narrative and understand, you know, that these characters are in the Bible are also people that were just are, you know, just like us. Like they go through things and feel emotions the way that we do because sometimes it feels like we iconize, you know, some of these characters and they they feel kind of like far away and like they're not really human. But if we step into the narrative um, in this way and invite our students to do so, it feels more alive. It feels more real and it feels like more relatable to them. Yeah. You know, when you're saying that, it makes me think like I we kind of think we're too mature if we've grown out of that. And so I actually really love looking at children's curriculum for some of these like embodied practices and then just integrate them in a more like mature way. Like, you know, I can't, I can't expect a 16 year old to want to act out the scripture, you know, act, you know, do like hand motions and all that. That might feel uncomfortable for them. Right. Um, but I can say, you know, like every time you hear the word heart, um, place your your hand over your heart. And while I read this, every time you hear the word heart, pay attention to your heartbeat. And that's that's a profound practice of being in touch with the body that God gave you, especially for a student of color. The, the body that God gave you is good and pay attention to the beat of your heart as connected to scripture, you know? Wow. Yeah, what, what you said kind of gave me a whole new meaning to the word uh, childlike faith, you know, like really to um, being to, able to embody that because... Kids, kids definitely do that um, on their own. We have a creative God, aka we have an imaginative God, um, but you know we forget that sometimes. Well, for our last question this season, we're ending each episode with the language to swap practice from the guide talking about race with teenagers. And at the end of each chapter in this guide, the author, the authors, um, Kat Armas, Jennifer Geraldana, and Erin Martinez give us a section with words or with phrases that we can use to be more hospitable when we're talking about race. So... When talking about racial inclusivity and representation with other adults or with teens, what is one word or phrase you have swapped out for better language or what phrase do you hope would change? One way, one thing that I have swapped out that has been really helpful for me um, is I don't call anyone, um, I don't call any white person a racist. Um, and that was really important for me when I started doing this work of anti-racism peacemaking, because I felt like the word, like calling someone racist, um, attaches so much of the baggage of the past to the work that they're trying to do in the present. And for me, I do this work and I want people to do this work because of Dr. King's vision of the beloved community and living into living in such a way that we own our belovedness. We proclaim each other's belovedness and then we protect the belovedness of our of all people. And we can't I personally can't own my belovedness if it's, if I am thinking of myself as I'm doing this work um, in like a, a, a phrase or an, or an idea that has such negative connotation. Now, some people are comfortable with it, but I'm not. So what I tend to do is I say this person is working in a way that is influenced by white supremacy or this beloved is influenced by white supremacy um and then that way just for me saying it that way reminds me to center the human and 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 call the good out in them and to do this work and not start from a place of like i'm attaching this like word of a lot of baggage i've just noticed so much um shame and overwhelm that is resting on them because they start this work feeling like horrible deplorable people and I'm like, no, you have just lived your life in such a way that you didn't see race because you've been influenced by white supremacy ideas, but you are still beloved. So I would love for us to start using more link, more people centered, humanizing, empathic language when we are calling our white, our white friends out because they need to be called out, but in a way that calls them into their identity of beloved. Well, I, I really got to think about this, um, but 
I, I think part of it is maybe the word minority. Um, so like instead of using the word minority, maybe we could say something like um, marginalized groups or underrepresented populations or um, historically uh, understudied populations, um, things like that, just to give kind of more nuance to to the word than just minority because minority is kind of so vague and and overgeneralized and i i think if we kind of talk about like why they're undeserved you know um what happened to them or underrepresented like why like what is it about the systems that you know the, uh these underrepresented populations they live in um what is it about the systems that they're they're in that you know resulted in their underrepresentation you know things like that mm, yeah for me is along those lines as well for me um you know sometimes in theology we say like this is theology and then that's latinx theology or liberation theology and that's another kind of theology and so all the theologies that are not coming from white males are contextual theologies but in reality all theology is contextual <laughs> and so <laughs> wait amen 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 there you go <laughs> love that <laughs> um so so for me it's like just saying like we need to name all of the theologies and where they come from so that um, we don't become ethnocentric in our understanding of God and we don't perpetuate that way of thinking to our younger generations. And so they're already aware that there are a lot of ways of perspe and perspectives of seeing the world and of seeing God. And I think it is up to us as the older generation to come like step into that with them and um and be able to name things with them of like so this is you know what this person from this time and place says and let's think about it critically taking all of that into consideration and you know this is what a woman from this background has said and you know why and putting all of those into conversation with each other as much as possible because it's you know we don't all experience the world in the same way and God doesn't show up for us in the same way. And so we need to, um, yeah, I think for me, that's, that's what I would, I, I'm trying to change and I hope would change. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for being with us today, Oshita. This was such a great and helpful, like so such a practical conversation, um, that I hope our li listeners will really enjoy. Well, thank you. It's been a joy to be with you all. Have a good one, listeners. Something at the Mulagi. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> if you want to read more about the original language to swap ideas, you can actually find them in the Ministry Toolkit Talking About Race with Teenagers. It's linked in our show notes. You can find us, the Fuller Youth Institute, on social media for more content and videos and to stay up to date on all the latest research we're doing. Thanks so much for listening. And finally, here is one final thought from a young person. So what have you found helpful from the teaching that you have received from youth leaders? I've had a lot of leaders at the church who make it a point to be involved in my life. And so most of what they have taught me or given to me has been because they have like specifically reached out and we've been able to talk, you know, one-on-one -on -one about things. Um, and so I guess if I were to like encourage other adults to do that more, that's really good.